um, it, um, so the, the budget, uh, setting that uh, preliminary budget is basically a way uh, for people to have a general sense of what our overall budget is uh, for the year uh, beyond just the, the tax levy that, uh, that we set. Uh, so uh, I'll be going through a presentation tonight. The council has seen this uh, for, for the most part, this presentation. Uh, as we've gone through the three work sessions that we've had uh, over the course of the summer. Uh, but this is really, uh, you know, people are invited to the work sessions, but this is really sort of the first public meeting that we have uh, that sort of introduces the, the budget and the tax levy for, uh, for this upcoming year. This uh, information, uh, if it's adopted tonight, will be used by the county uh, auditor's office to be able to put in the truth and taxation statements that are sent out in mid uh, November, uh, which not only uh, show people what the impact of uh, decisions on tax levy would be for them and their individual home, but also gives them information on uh, uh, when our truth and taxation hearing would be so that if they have any comments or concerns, questions that they'd be able to come to that uh, and share them or share them with us previously. So with that being said, I'm going to jump into uh, this presentation and uh, really start with uh, just a reminder of some of the discussion items that we had from last year's budget process. So that was set, uh, for setting the 2022 budget. So last year when we were going through the same process, uh, we were talking about the continued utilization, uh, utilization of our tax levy policy. Our tax levy policy was uh, established back in 2015. Uh, 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 sort of following uh, uh, changes that we saw during the uh, uh, recession uh, that we saw back in 2008 and 9 through about 2013. Uh, but it's really to limit tax levy growth to capture only new growth and expenditure inflation. Uh, and that's really because those are really the two things that if you're not going to change your service level should be the things that actually change the, the amount uh, that it should cost to provide those services and only increasing the levy beyond this if new programs or initiatives are added. Uh, and then last year, uh, the uh, other big item that we talked about was the continued implementation of our capital asset maintenance program, which is a million dollars towards, uh, towards our, our camp program, which is really replacing assets that we've already invested into. A uh, couple other things that we talked about last year in, in the process, uh, we talked about reinstituting our staffing study implementation. So this was a program that we started back in 2020 uh, to fill uh, a gap after doing a staffing study through Baker Tilly, our financial advisor, uh, determined that citywide we were about 16 employees short uh, of where we should be at that point and that uh, we came up with a four-year plan to how to implement that. We went through 2020 uh, and then COVID hit. So in 2021, we put a, a, a halt uh, to that uh, process until things sort of got back to normal. And then uh, it, for 2022, we re-implemented that program and then have two years uh, left to implement that program in 2023 and 2024. And then we continued to work on our general fund reserve balance. Uh, we kept in place uh, something that we had uh, added in 2021, which was $300,000 dedicated towards uh, building up our reserves uh, to help us. This is really to help us uh, take some of the recommendations coming from our auditors uh, uh, about the level of reserves that we should have to keep our current bond rating. Uh, we have seen success uh, in this since... Uh, uh, since we did this, uh, we actually saw the fund balance increase by $1.1 million in 2021, and we expect that's going to happen in 2022 uh, as, as well. Um, as far as our budgeting objectives, uh, we have an, a number of them that we've used to help us establish uh, our uh, budget. So first one is supporting our budgeting programs that help Chaska strength, strengthen its mission of being the best small town in Minnesota. Um, utilizing our existing levy policy. So again, limiting tax levy growth to capture only new growth in the community and expenditure inflation and only increase this levy beyond this point if new services, uh, assets or initiatives are being added. 
Uh, and again, that was a, a policy that we established back in 2015. Uh, third objective is to maintain our existing high quality service levels. Uh, fourth one is to fully fund the maintenance and replacement uh, financing of our vehicles, equipment, and physical assets on a regular schedule so that we can uh, ensure sustainability of the investments we've already made. Uh, next one is to fund new programs only after existing necessary programs are funded. Uh, next one is budgeting, utilizing a plan that avoids drawdown of our general fund reserves. Uh, next one is fully funding our levy needs of our street reconstruction program. And then the last one is developing a long-term budget plan that's sustainable from a resource perspective to support uh, service levels that residents expect. So the budget environment. Uh, so it, it's always important for us to sort of understand where is our environment sort of big picture as we're looking at this next year's budget. Uh, first of all, the impacts of COVID on the general fund have been pretty minimal during the 2022 year, especially in the general fund. Uh, we're really, for all practical purposes, back to normal there. Uh, we're still recovering in our recreational funds, especially such as our community center, where we're continuing to see growth back of the membership that we lost during that time period, uh, but it's still not completely back to normal. And then our curling center operations have really returned to uh, near normal to where we were pr uh, prior to COVID. Uh, we've continued to see significant growth in the community over the past year. Uh, currently, our uh, numbers uh, that we budget for permits are uh, expected to uh, uh, exceed what we expected or what we set for the budget this year. Um, you know, interest rates could uh, impact the pace of development as we move into the upcoming year, but that's something we'll have to pay attention to. And then we've seen new growth in the community and the uh, strong real estate market uh, increases, have increased our taxable market values in the community significantly over the last 12 months. And we'll see that as we look at our market values. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the, uh, this list sort of looks at our, uh, both our overall market value growth from 2016 forward. And you can see, you know, we've seen anywhere from a low of 2.8% in 2020 to a high of about 9.14% in 2019. And then 2022, we saw a 22.35% increase um, uh, in overall growth and 2.17% of that new growth. So uh, most of this, uh, you know, we tend to see our market values for tax purposes lag about a year to two behind when we see uh, any types of major impacts in the real estate market. Obviously, over the last uh, couple of years, the real estate market has been extremely hot in the Twin Cities area, and we've seen pricing on homes go up pretty significantly. We've seen that really across the board on all aspects of the, uh, of the real estate market where we've seen some pretty dramatic increases. Um, That's why we're probably looking at that 22.35 versus. Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's, you know, it's, you know, it, it, it'd be better to see those spread over a couple of years. Um, but uh, um, it's really sort of impacting us based on when that impacted the market. So, you know, the, the county assessor's office looks at that as of uh, January 1st of a given year. And so given when the real estate market really hit its peaks, that's they saw it really sort of happen all at once. Um, most market value in, uh, uh, growth is coming through increases in existing properties. And I think a lot of people have seen that as people put up, have put up their homes for sale because they've been able to get a lot more than what they paid for it. Uh, so 20.18% of the total 22.35% growth was coming through existing residential prop or existing properties. And then, uh, Another environmental factor is we'll continue to see zero dollars in local government aid in 2023. Uh, from a building permit perspective, uh, building permits over the last two years have been very steady. Uh, we're seeing growth in all sectors of the economy, including new single family homes, industrial and com uh, uh, commercial projects as well. Uh, this chart below sort of shows where we were, and, and actually this is uh, from back in July. 
uh, we're, we're well beyond this at, at this point, and we fully expect that we're going to see a year as high, if not higher than 2021 uh, for our, uh, for the total number of units that we'll have added in the community. Um, and we expect that our building permit revenue, which we uh, budgeted about 1.5 million last year, um, or I'm sorry, that we, uh, we, we budgeted last year about 1.1 uh, uh, million. Uh, we budgeted uh, similar for this year. And we think uh, both years, uh, last year we did see about 1.5 to $1.6 million in building permit, permit revenues. We expect to see the same thing this year as well. Um, but we are planning for some slowdown in growth because of the rising interest rates. Um, you know, that's, I think that's something uh, that we can expect, although I will say that we haven't really seen it. Um, you know, we keep track on a weekly basis of how many housing permits that we uh, actually have uh, pulled, and I haven't seen much of a change at all. Uh, we're seeing about, uh, you know, typically four to six residential building permits per week, and it's been about the number that we've seen consistently uh, over the entire summer. Uh, and we also have some large commercial industrial projects that are moving forward now too, which is uh, definitely increasing to that uh, building happening in the community. So when this chart shows, uh, this chart is actually generated from the Carver County Assessor's Office. This is what they provide to us to give us sort of an overall uh, picture of what happened in our, uh, for our market taxable market values. And these are the market values that will be uh, uh, for payable 2023. So again, you can see in the bottom right hand corner, 22.35% is the overall increase. Uh, and then the residential market, we saw a 24.61% increase. Commercial industrial was a 14.05% increase. Uh, apartments were a 21.30% increase, and ag was an 8.55% increase. And it's interesting to point out that for uh, 2023, uh, for taxes payable, we'll have about $4.2 billion of value uh, in the community uh, that we have for uh, taxable market value. So we have definitely grown from a market value perspective. Um, again, over 90% of this growth uh, in market values is related to existing property values. Um, and like we talked about before is that uh, taxable market values tend to lag about a year behind what we actually see in the actual market. Uh, in 2021, obviously we were sort of in the midst of a very hot resident, uh, re residential uh, resale market, uh, but our overall increase for taxable market value was only 4.9%, but that was really looking back about a year or two before that. Um, when you look at that 8.55% of ag, how is that, is that just based on percentage of land that's left in our, what is well, that? It's, it's based on, what it's really saying is that the land that's still out there for ag is development property and it's increasing in value. Okay. And we've definitely seen that as we've seen, you know, I guess maybe not as we've seen, but we've heard what people are getting for their their properties has definitely been increasing. This shows a distribution of Chaska's market values, and this has re uh, remained relatively stable for a long time. And to me, what this really shows is that, you know, the base of our community is residential, but we have a really good, healthy mix of uh, commercial industrial at 9%, uh, apartments at 7%, and then the ag land is really the, the remaining land that's out there uh, remaining to develop. Uh, this chart shows you uh, sort of what we've seen from a visual perspective for tax taxable market values. Uh, I've pointed this out in past years that, you know, 2009 uh, to, and 2010 was really sort of, you know, the peak that we saw of sort of our growth between 2000 and 2008, uh, which was a really, uh, you know, there was a lot of building that was occurring back in the early part of the 2000s. And we saw, saw our peak uh, for value in 2009 and 2010. And then we saw uh, for the first time ever market values go backwards. 
And it took until 2016 or 17 to actually rebound stuff that we lost going all the way back to 2009 or 2010. So it took a long time to recover uh, after that recession, not quite a decade, but quite a while. Um, Were you saying that, one, that it would take us at least five years and it ends up being six and seven? Yeah. It, it takes a long time to come back from a drop. Yes. Um, but you can see not only did it come back, it thrived. I mean, we, we saw values come back pretty dramatically. Um, and you can see, especially between 21 and 22, the amount of increase that we saw, uh, for taxable market values. And we, you know, we're showing here that, uh, uh, a 2% increase for the next five years we've actually seen about an 8.8% annual increase in market values uh, over, uh, over the last five years. So history would tell us that, that the numbers that we're showing for the projection forward are lower uh, than what we probably will see, uh, but we try to be a little bit conservative when we're looking forward. Um, it's sort of a kind of a ghost period coming up here a little bit we don't know what's going to happen it's yeah i mean we we really don't know what's going to happen with that being said we continue to hear from industrial developers that say, say that there's still an 18 million square foot deficit for uh industrial in the twin cities area there's not many spaces uh left from here going in towards the city to actually build and the southwest has traditionally been a pretty hot uh industrial market uh, and industrial will lead to houses because uh, people will move to town, at leads to houses, and then typically uh, uh, commercial follows that. Um, we'll point out that uh, you know, you'll hear about, here are recommendations uh, as we're going through for what to do for 2023. Based on the market value growth that we've seen, uh, we would actually see our tax rate go down by 1.53% uh, with the recommendations we're making, even with our building program and, and staffing study, I'd go from a tax rate of 32.083% down to 31.359 or 592. Uh, so uh, definitely a, a different sort of, of market that we're in now. Uh, I always like to throw out uh, sort of what we've seen for new construction. Uh, increases in the community because I, I think the the one thing that is critical when we're looking at it, and, and this is in our tax levy policy, is if we want to keep our service levels the same, um, we always have to at least make sure that we're capturing the new growth that happens in our community. Because for every new residential unit we have, new commercial unit we have, there's some increase in cost and service for policing or for road maintenance or any of those types of things uh, uh, that occur. So uh, that's why I think it's important for us to understand. You can see that we've, even during the recession years, we saw uh, new growth occurring in the community. Uh, local government aid, uh, again, uh, we will not see anything uh, happen uh, for 2022. Uh, and um, as I shared with you guys at the, the last meeting, you know, we were at a million dollars uh, back before we started losing aid. And I think that the important thing to recognize is that we never really, we never formally recaptured or re-levied for any of that lost local government aid. So when we look specifically at things like our staffing program that, uh, uh, you know, is about a million dollars, you know, part of the reason that we weren't able to really keep up with staffing is we never really captured those lost resources when we lost them uh, to begin with. So, you know, I think once we get past the, the staffing study implementation, we really would have recouped uh, those lost revenues that we, uh, that we saw with the loss of, of LGA um, uh, over the last uh, several years. This is our building permit revenue. So the two tall lines in 2021 uh, 20, and 2022, those represent uh, what, well, 2021 represents our actual, which is about 1.5 million. 2022 in this one represents what we think is gonna be, although I expect it's probably gonna be higher uh, than this. So we put it at least 1.5, but you'll see for 2023, we did not 
uh, we're not recommending that we budget at that amount. Uh, the reason being is it only takes one large commercial industrial project to not happen to all of a sudden not see the, uh, you know, that amount of growth or building permits occur in, in the community. So we're trying to be uh, a little bit uh, more cautious with that. And then if we do like we did this past year, uh, end up uh, uh, generating more than we anticipated that we can put those into our general fund reserves uh, to be able to help us in those years that might not be as as uh, uh, good at building years as as others. We continue to see our population uh, rise. So you can see in 2021, we saw 225 new units. 2022, uh, we put that we expect that we're going to see about 200 units. Uh, it could be more than that. Uh, but that would put our population at just over 28,000. Uh, so, and by, which matches up pretty close. It's, it's just within a couple hundred of what the Met Council came up with their estimate uh, for our population. So we're pretty close to what the Met Council is showing too. And then shows if we increase by 150 units uh, each year that we can expect our population within this five-year period to get uh, pretty close to 30,000. Uh, residents. Our ultimate build out we expect is about 36, 37,000 people. So our electric transfer. So one of the things that we do with our own electric utility uh, is that we have a 10% electric transfer that comes from our electric fund into our general fund. Uh, we charge this as basically a right away fee, uh, which we also are in the process of, of charging of all for all utilities, uh, electric utilities, which are in the community, including Minnesota Valley and Excel. Uh, it's for basically compensating the general fund, the general public for the acquisition of right away to be able to put uh, those utilities in. Um, so you can see 10% uh, transfer in 2022 is gonna be uh, you know, about four and a half million dollars. Um, it should be pointed out that we continue to do this, but our rates have continued to be significantly, significantly less than Excel. Now, I talked about it a few weeks ago, everybody's rates are high now, but our rates continue to be, our wholesale rates have been 10% lower than Excel. Uh, so uh, we've been able to, to continue to perform well and support the general fund too. We see anything future-wise with you sitting on MMPA? Does that continue that growth? Is it gonna taper off? Any, um, any magic ball? Well, for, for us, I think it's gonna continue to expand. And I think one of the things that we have to really be looking at- I mean, at, our cost, like the oh, our overall cost. electric cost. Or the, yeah, and in fact- Natural gas, are they talking that it might come down again or is it gonna, we're gonna stay in never, never land here? I think we're going to, for the next several months, be staying. Now, one thing that's going to change is that we're getting out of that peak cooling season. And so, you know, the rates might be high, but people's bills are going to be lower uh, because there won't be as much usage. It, it's like a double whammy when it happens in July. It's, it's your peak usage, and it was the peak cost. Um, natural gas for heat, so... Yeah, and and uh, you know, Center Point, you know, Center Point actually just went through a rate uh, case because of the whole Texas uh, issue that happened a little over a year and a half ago, um, where uh, they had a significant amount of usage of very expensive natural gas when Texas had that cold snap. Uh, so yeah, I mean it's it can impact people through that too. Um, I do know that MMPA is gonna uh, be getting out shortly, uh, sort of a, what they sort of project uh, coming up over the next several months. So as soon as I have that, I'll share that with you guys. Uh, major baseline discussions for 2023. So this upcoming year. So again, like last year, uh, continue to look at the utilization of our tax levy policy uh, like we have in the past. Uh, continued implementation of our capital asset maintenance program, which was known as our CIP. That's actually part of our base levy level uh, 
it's part of that what's included in our tax levy policy as uh, in our base level expenditures. I separate, separate it out because I just want you guys to see the projects that, uh, that we're gonna do, uh, but there's, it's included in that base level. There's not an additional tax to support that. Uh, continued, uh, continued implementation of our staffing study, as I mentioned before, uh, we have two years remaining on that program. And then the start of the implementation of our four-year building improvement plan, which that's been the major focus of, of our discussions over the past uh, several months and uh, a lot of the uh, outreach that we've had in the public over the last several months has been around that building program. So as far as our operational tax levy, uh, so again, our policy of focus is on establishing a levy based on factors that impact our actual cost of services. So it's not saying... Uh, that you know our uh, rate is a so much and we just collect the revenue based on that rate, we say, okay, if we're going to change, we should change it based on what, it, we're at, what we actually have an in increased cost. Uh, so that's uh, expenditure inflation and new growth are the ones that directly impact that cost of service and that, um, you know, that our cost of providing the same service increases uh, because we have new residents to provide that service to and because we have inflationary uh, impacts uh, to our costs as well. And that the policy would go on to say that we'd only add to that uh, if we had a new program uh, that we're adding and that we should add it based on the actual cost of that program. So our staffing study and the building improvement program would be examples of that. So for 2022, uh, we saw this in the chart, our new growth uh, was at 2.17%. Uh, we put in a number of inflation of about 5%. Uh, we all know that inflation hasn't been 5%. It's been closer to 9%. Um, but uh, because we're talking about uh, some of the bigger impacts with being able to look at our building program, we're suggesting that we put a cap at that inflation rate at 5% or right around 5% uh, uh, because we think we can balance our budget doing it that way and just recognizing that our building program is gonna increase costs and we're trying to, to keep it to a minimum. So based on that approximate 5% uh, in, of inflation and 2.17% in new growth, uh, our operational levy would increase by 7.28%. Um, and you know th this is what would be needed to provide the services we already have in place. So based on our uh, anticipated increase in net tax capacity, so we're actually seeing about a, over a 24% increase in our tax capacity uh, in, in the community for this next year. Uh, we would actually see our tax rate go down significantly if we were to address only our baseline services. In fact, it would probably uh, be a decrease of over 17% uh, in our, uh, in our uh, uh, tax rate uh, if we were to just deal with our baseline services. But the impact for a baseline growth on a median value home is, and the median value home in the community now is $370,700, uh, would be about $4.50 per month uh, to deal with those baseline services. So again, included in those baseline services is the, is the CAMP program. I'm only separating it because I just want people to understand what are some of the projects that they can expect for next year. So um, this was a program that we took four years to fully implement in 2017. That was the first year that we uh, had reached up to a million dollars that we put into this each year. And um, it really includes those basic, uh, funding those basic city assets like street overlay program, our seal coating, uh, resurfacing our trails, uh, rehabbing our neighborhood parks and community parks, and then rehabbing things that, you know, miscellaneous things that we have like uh, parking lots or retaining walls or things like that, or pavers. So in 2023, the three big uh, items that are on the uh, uh, docket for next year is about $500,000 that would go towards our over overlay program, which would include the Western Ridge neighborhood, Autumn Woods South, and then the Wildflower Lane uh, area. 
We have $500,000 allocated towards the remodel of City Square Park. Uh, we have a lot of work to still get to a point of, of you know, getting plans put together for that. But we'd like to be in a position to try to do the remodel of that park while Highway 41 is closed so that we try to have as little impact. Well, if we're going to have a bigger impact, let's have it while uh, there's already impact going on. And then would that be, would that be a bid out or would that be our own staff doing some of that? A little bit of both. A little bit of both. Yep. And then uh, trail resurfacing. We try to resurface three miles of trail uh, each year. Uh, it costs 20,000 miles per uh are twenty thousand dollars per mile of resurfacing, so we include sixty thousand dollars per year. Uh, twenty twenty four, uh, we have the uh, street seal uh, coating overlay program. Um, we have trail resurfacing. We have uh, general work that we need to do at the MSB. Uh, rehab of the Hickory Street and Shadow neighborhood parks, and then uh, retaining wall improvements. We are looking at the uh, mayor, you had made the request of seeing if uh, potentially we could look at Lions Park uh, for that year to try to match up uh, with uh, the improvements that we're making to shelter there. So we're taking a look at, at sort of the overall park program and what we can do there. So that's something we'll have more uh, information as we get further into the budgeting process. I say it's nothing, certainly anything that wants to cause some budget issues, but if it if it can work, then the whole park's rehab together. And that just, uh, I don't know, kind of one of the things why it's already tore up. It'd be good to just keep doing most of the amenities. Yep. And then for 2025, um, again, Lions Park, we might uh, uh, shift that around. Uh, we have our street seal coat that we try to do $500,000 a year. And the other big one would be uh, Lions hockey rink and light replacement is one that needs to get replaced. And that would be similar to uh, what just happened up in Clover Ridge uh, at the hockey rink uh, up in that uh, community park. This goes into more detail than we need to, but I'll ask the question. <clears throat> we can talk it later too. With Lions Park, huh. like some of my interactions with Lions Park is major drainage issues. Does that get it? I mean, like when it heavy rains, it puddles and dugouts and puddle, puddles in there. Is that when you rehab or look at a park reconstruction? Is that will that get looked at? Some of it gets addressed with this, uh, with the park shelter uh, improvements that are being made, because a lot of that drainage issue is happening right around the park shelter itself. It yeah. Um, I, I'd have to talk to Brian about. Yeah, the I'm rest just curious because I like. Yeah. I mean, that is. <laughs> it's actually an issue we have in a lot of our community parks. Yeah, I'm sure. community, community park, we have an issue in like uh, uh, baseball field four. It's the one with the grass infield mm -hmm. in it. Uh, we with have the drink, wetland behind with the it. wetland behind it, okay. and so um, we could barely drive in there when we built that. <laughs> I'm surprised we put it there, but it's pretty wet. I think we tiled it. I think somebody yes, yeah, we, we tiled it. Yep, uh, but it's. Uh, Drainage has been an issue in some some of our community parks. Chaska soil. Yeah. <laughs> it, what, so are you saying the ball fields? Are you saying no, the outer? No, it's, it's his point. It's a lot around like, like the. It's a pinwheel, right? Like you kind of have the it's around the pinwheel of the shelter. It's kind of that intersection. The fields seem fine. It's like your dugouts and your sidewalks into it. And then yeah. between the fields, tend the water tends to sit and has nowhere to go because the fields are draining towards the creek and towards the sides, but the water gets stuck in the middle there. It's kind of and has no place to go. And when you're it's muddy and messy and you're there with young kids, it's like the most attractive thing for a kid and the worst thing for a parent. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's it's definitely around that that area of the, the shelter definitely has been an issue. It's part of the park amenities. <laughs> it it's, a, it's a swimming pool. <laughs> it's a flash pad. Yeah. Um, yeah. this is really minor, but I think it's pretty cool. Um, you know, with, you know, lions are invest, the actual lions are investing, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of dollars into the rehab of that shelter. And as part of that, we're putting in one of those lion's head drinking fountains. Um, you know, 
I thought they were really cool when I was young. And I, th I, th I, th I think uh, that could be a nice attraction for, for kids to come down to the park and stuff, but uh, that's getting put in with the shelter building. They started coming up out of the ground already with it? No, uh, last Friday, oh, I think it was Friday, they tore it down. Oh. Uh, next thing is our staffing study implementation. So this is, uh, well, it's an ongoing program, but this is a new thing. Uh, so again, staffing study was completed by Baker Tilly, who was our financial advisors back in, uh, it was about 2017, 2018. Uh, we got to a point in 2020 of uh, actually starting to put dollars towards that, um, which basically we determined that there was uh, a, uh, if we looked at over a four-year period with a $1.5 million gap, it was $375,000 that were more general fund expenses, so tax levy supported, and about $125,000 of that coming from, it, from our enterprise funds. So some of our positions like water and sewer maintenance employees, um, stormwater maintenance, uh, they're supported by our utilities. Uh, so that's why we had, and also building uh, maintenance, there's enterprise fund buildings that are maintained too. And so we want to make sure that they're contributing to, to that as well. So uh, that's what we established in 2020 was basically uh, the $500,000 uh, a year for four years to address the positions plus $500,000 to go towards building maintenance activities because we really, we up until this point, we hadn't had a building maintenance uh, department to actually uh, deal with that. Um, so 2021, again, we did delay it by young, one year because of COVID, and then we restarted again last year. Uh, when we did restart it last year, we did talk about one thing that our staffing uh, study uh, was short on uh, was in our police department. And we identified over the last three years of the program that uh, there was a need for adding one officer per year for those three years. So the total amount for that, uh, for the remaining two years of the program, and this was the same amount last year, is $487,000 of additional tax levy uh, for each of the remaining two years, plus $125,000 uh, for each of the remaining two years of the, in the enterprise fund budget. So if we address uh, that, uh, on the medium value home, the 370,000, it should say $370,700 is a medium value home. That adds an additional $4 per month. So uh, between the baseline tax growth and the staffing study, it has an impact of approximately $8 per month on the medium value home. As far as the positions that we have remaining in the last two years of the staffing study, so for 2023, uh, we have a second city planner position uh, being considered an economic development coordinator position, a water sewer maintenance worker, a park maintenance worker, and our 29th patrol officer. And then the 2024 plan positions would be our building maintenance worker, which would be the fifth of our five positions that were identified, network support specialist, a stormwater maintenance worker, a street maintenance worker, uh, the second water sewer maintenance worker, and then patrol officer number 30. Uh, so those would be the remaining uh, uh, positions left uh, in those two years. And then once we get those positions filled, you know, that was really to get us to where we should be now. And then any new positions in the future would be attributed to growth. Uh, so they uh, would be added based on the, the need for increasing services, but also revenues increase too because of the growth that's occurring in the community. Uh, two positions that are including included in our staffing recommendations for this year that aren't part of the staffing study and really are growth related positions is our third rental inspector uh, slash full time firefighter in our fire department. Uh, as we talked uh, last time, the uh, we just have approved 500 new rental uh, units in the community. Uh, we do have rental license that we require for each of those rental units, which then we go out and actually inspect each of those uh, units on, uh, on a regular basis. And so uh, the rental uh, fee, rental license fee would support this third uh, position. 
uh, which also then helps fill some of our daytime uh, firefighting needs as well. And then the community engagement coordinator position, this is one that was really meant to help provide additional resources towards some of the work that was already going on uh, within, uh, you know, especially during COVID uh, when uh, we started the Chaska Cares program and, and some of the things that were more people-centered services. You know, we've had great work occur from, you know, people like Julie Janke and our Parks and Rec Department, who is really saying, how do we add the proper resources to that and provide support to allow that to, to occur and, and really put even more emphasis towards our people-centered services. So this was something that came out of our department, our last department head uh, council retreat that we uh, had um, after, right, right after COVID. Um, yeah, pretty much right after COVID. So uh, this one is one that actually is uh, would support every uh, department in the city. And so each department uh, would need to uh, contribute about $10,000 per department to be able to fund this position. So it's not a huge uh, lift by any of the departments, but together putting their resources together, we can create somebody that can really help emphasize those uh, those uh, community or people-centered services within our community. Well, I already talked about this. They were with the Julie then? Is that yeah. what they were So that the intent would be is to, you know, Julie would continue to go on and do the stuff that she does. The hope would be is that this would allow us to have some resources to be able to spread it through other departments in the city too, and also support her because, because Julie goes outside of the police department now. Um, so really to provide her some, so, uh, some support. Um, one of the, you know, some of the support that she was getting during COVID was a lot of it was coming from the park and rec department. But once the park and rec department sort of got back and running full steam, um, they just don't, they have their own jobs that they need to complete for programming and things like that. And so they're not able to provide as much support towards that. And so it's really saying, how do we have somebody that's dedicated to this can go across the entire organization and help uh, supplement things like the, the things that Julie's doing. Um, so those were sort of the, the sort of the first two items is our baseline and our staffing study. Our last item that really has been the, the one that we've put uh, the majority of our effort to, or uh, discussion into over the last several months is our building improvement program. So our facilities, uh, we've talked about this before, are over 30 years old with little reinvestment that's been put into these buildings over time. And really space has not been added to accommodate the growth of employees, equipment, service needs, things like that. Uh, the facilities were built originally using one-time dollars. So there really hasn't been the ability to take retiring debt and be able to roll it into sort of what our new needs have been. And our tax levy has historically been low, uh, very low, one of the lowest in the, in the Twin Cities which really hasn't given us a lot of additional resources to be able to put into reinvesting into our core assets. So as we looked at this, and this is something we talked about in our, our council department ed retreat, but we really sort of came out of that. And one of the first things we did is we hired an architect at Leeway Daily uh, to not just say anecdotally, we have an issue, but let's, let's, put, some, let's put some actual figures to this. Uh, so we hired Leo A. Daly to really look at what do we, what do we really need from a space uh, needs and coming up with concepts of how we could address this, but also a construction management firm, RJM Construction, to uh, complete uh, what we felt was really important is to get a good sense of what the costs uh, of these uh, dealing with these issues would be. So they identified the square footage needs of every general fund department. They developed a concept plan to address each of the department needs, and then they developed a conceptual pricing to uh, accomplish implementing uh, the building recommendations that were being made. My mouth is getting really dry. <laughs> All right. Um, the findings of this study were presented to the council in May. Uh, along with recommendations for how uh, to fund these facilities. So we did have Leeway Daily prior to COVID do a uh, 
space needs analysis, uh, which really sort of served as the basis for this. And, and even as we had our council department at retreat, we talked about, well, here's generally what they talked about for space needs analysis. They really dug in on this one and not only sort of took those space needs, but then also said, how could you develop some concept plans to be able to address the, the building needs out there? So this uh, uh, planning, uh, uh, including the, uh, included uh, the uh, uh, building of a new library. So we've, we've had uh, quite a bit of input from the public about uh, desire for a library that better fits the, the space needs uh, for a community our size. We're about uh, a third, if not uh, uh, greater deficit and what we typically would see for a library for a community this size. And then uh, looked at how to recapture that needed space in City Hall for city services. I uh, also looked at uh, the uh, Municipal Service Building and then our public safety uh, campuses as, as well. Uh, so since the May meeting, there's been significant efforts to educate the public on these needs, the concept funding and building plans, uh, the impacts to a medium value home for implementing a program to address these facilities. And, um, you know, so, you know, we've gone to park parties. We've, I mean, you guys have been at all of it. So it's, we've, we've done a lot of the, of the outreach to the public. And, you know, at least what I've heard throughout this is, I mean, nobody likes the thought of having to pay more. I mean, that's just a, I think that's just a given, but I do think that people have understood the needs uh, that are out there for the, for the facility and recognizing uh, that improvements are needed uh, for this and that we need some type of a plan to be able to, to move forward with this. Um, so uh, basically uh, the plan that we uh, recommended back in uh, May was to implement this program over a four year period and uh, basically doing it so that we could really not see the impact of, of a program all in one year, but how do we address it over a four year period from a funding perspective so that we could try to mitigate the impact uh, and also try to allow growth uh, to try to take care of some of that as we move into these future years too. So uh, the following was the priority uh, list and this is in order. Uh, of, of how we sort of saw the priority. First and foremost is a public safety facility. Uh, so our greatest need right now is in the police station. Uh, the police are housed in about 8,000 square foot. They really should be in about 40,000 square foot to uh, meet our needs. And the biggest uh, aspects of, of concern there is not having the adequate facilities to be able to do the things that we need to do from a service perspective, but there's also some pretty significant safety and security concerns for our employee, employees in the, in the police station compared to other facilities. And so how do we develop a, a campus that meets our community needs, but also addresses those deficiencies that we have in our facility now? The second would be our municipal service building. Uh, this building is about half the size it should be, and it's pretty easy to see when you visit the facility, excuse me, visit the facility, uh, because you can see about a third of our vehicles parked outside. Uh, the ones that are parked inside, it's like a Tetris game in there to, you know, try to get these vehicles uh, to actually get in. It makes it pretty inefficient for, you know, especially when we have uh, emergencies, which do happen in municipal services, to be able to get to the equipment that we need to efficiently to be able to address those. And this has really happened mainly because of rapid growth in our community. So we've had a significant number of mileage of new streets in the community, uh, new utilities that have been put in, uh, and really the things that those guys do on a day-to-day -day basis to, to maintain those. And they, they need new equipment to address those new developments. The library is the third one. Um, you know, this, there's no question, at least from my perspective, as we've been out talking to the community, the library is the one that people want the most. Um, that's, that's the one that, that I've definitely heard people say, don't forget the library. Um, one thing about the library and the reason we're putting it number three is we really can't forget about the library if we wanna deal with city hall uh, because 
originally when this building was built in 1987, it was intended to last uh, up until about 2020. And the thought behind it was, is to build our initial library within the city hall facility. And then as our uh, city hall needs expanded, or the needs for services expanded, that, that the library would move out and that we would just recapture that space to be able to, to keep our, our general city services in here. And that's exactly what can happen. I mean, I think one of the uh, great things about the, the plan that Leroy Daly put together is we're able to accommodate everything on land that we already own. And for facilities like City Hall, we don't need to add on to this facility. We need to remodel it. And we need to recapture the space of the library and the police department to meet our space needs. Because right now, most of our uh, most of our uh, conference room needs are met in this room. Uh, we pull out the card tables there in the back, uh, you know, for development meetings. Uh, for and it's just we don't have this. We had to move. Uh, IT out of the facility and they're in the fire station now. So we just don't have that space in here, but we will have that space if the library and the police station move. So we, uh, so we put the library third because we, to do city hall right, we need to really wait until those things are out. So like going back there, like if, if this all gets approved and we can move forward and if we start on a public safety facility, can we also start like as far as uh, like moving the power line and stuff like that, stuff that takes a long time so we can do that stuff? We can. I mean, some of the limitations we're going to have is just uh, dollars. But with that being said, um, you know, that it would make sense for us to do that right away um, because that takes some time to go through the process with Excel to get that done. And by the time we actually would get through that process is about the time that we'd actually meet that need. Okay. Cause I, I just know that that's, that's a big deal to have to do that. But. The other thing that you'd likely see too, cause, and, and I'll go through sort of the, the timing of this is, you know, we're talking about, you know, the start of this program now, but if we start this program now, we don't we won't have the money nor the capacity to be able to get these all these facilities done until 2029 is going to be when the city hall is completed so i mean we're only in 2022 right now so um you know so there's going to be some time period in between now and when we finish uh that like say when the police station moves out of city hall we're probably going to move some of the services we have down into the police station temporarily. So we wouldn't go out and buy cubes or things like that, but we'd sort of spread the services so that we could use that space, recapture some conference room space. So it'd be sort of temporary moves that we'd move people to be able to deal with those immediate space needs, but maybe not necessarily the remodel until we get to that point. So that, oh, I, yeah. that all makes perfect sense. It's just that, you know, I know some of these take a lot of, it's just complex in what we're doing and it'd be nice to stay ahead of the curve. And a lot of it's about getting the plans in place. Yes. And that takes a lot of time in itself. And, you know, we might be, say, we could be building the public safety, but we could be working on the plans for everything else, you know. And, well, and that's, like that's that. what you'll sort of see as we go through this, as we somebody used the term last time, which I thought was really good, daisy chaining it. I don't know. One of you two used the term. Okay. So, so now we, now we, okay. The mayor pro tem used that. <laughs> he used the term daisy chain. Thanks. All right. Um, she got upset because I, <laughs> I thought Michaela was running the meeting tonight. <laughs> got that idea it's just because i was really good at it i didn't let him know that it wasn't i forgot to do that <laughs> oops he was busy today yeah so uh yeah so we would plan on sort of daisy chaining these so that we would get the designs done in one and then while we're building starting the building the next one then we would start the actual design of the next and part of that is uh you know we really we think just like with the, the uh, 
planning process that we did, we really think we need to have a construction manager that's going to be here through the entire term of these improvements and for multiple reasons. First of all, to sort of keep, keep us going, uh, be able to coordinate the activities with the architects, but also, you know, one of the things we want to accomplish through this program, especially with the new building maintenance department, is, you know, there's going to be different architects that need to work on each of these facilities because they're all going to focus in different areas. But there are some components of buildings that are just like HVAC. You know, the HVAC in one building is not a whole lot different than the HVAC in another building. We need to get to some consistency between our facilities of what type of HVAC units we have, what type of, you know, utilities we have, um, you know, down to what type of toilet paper dispensers do we have? Because right now it's different in every facility. So uniformity brings uniformity brings and cost benefits. Yes. That we, that, you know, that we, if we have a system that we feel comfortable with an HVAC that we, you know, develop a relationship with somebody that can be able to, to help take care of the major things in each of our buildings that, you know, when we're ordering supplies for buildings that we're ordering one type of thing instead of having to order 20 different types of things. Um, I mean, that's, if you were to talk to the building maintenance department now, I am certain that would be one of their frustrations is everything is different in every facility that we have. And so we need somebody that's going to, even though we have different architects that really need to focus on those specialties of the things that we have in the facilities, there's some things that don't need to be specialized and they should be uniform. And so, uh, so that'll be part of this process as well. So if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying a construction manager, you're saying, is that not us or that's just like an outside entity that's it's going an to be outside brought entity on? That basically it also gives us some flexibility of how we actually do the projects. So sometimes, you know, you can go to a, 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 a more of a design build or a, a, this is getting in more of his world, but uh, um, you can use different types of bidding uh, uh, processes to be able to get the best cost benefit out of things, having a, a construction manager compared to uh, just having a general architect go out and do a straight bid. Uh, so um, there's, there's potential cost savings for having a construction manager on, uh, even though you have to pay for their services, uh, they bring some of that, those abilities to do some different techniques that can save you money, uh, both in the short-term constructing, but also in the long-term for continuity. Yeah, so. And they act like a, sorry, um, they act like a point person, I would assume and stuff well, as well. Yep. That is nice. I think of, I know that it's not exactly the same, but I think of, with all the downtown reconstruction, I think his name is Brad. Yep. It's like the, like all the residents are always, that's one thing I hear, like Brad's been amazing. He keeps us sewing. And I've even dealt with him since one of my houses was out in that. Um, and he was great. So I think of it that way, like how nice it was to have a point person. I know the residents have liked that. So I would assume, you know, just having that one person even for continuity through the whole thing does sound like a huge benefit. Yeah, we, we actually did that through the COVID dollars when we did those COVID improvements. And it was actually RJM that we had through that. That's We had a great experience with them. I mean, if you remember, we had to get those dollars spent by like within three months and which was a very difficult task, but having that one person there as continuity makes a big difference. Yeah, and we did something similar when we did the um, remodel of the Southwest Transit bus garage too. We had a, a we hired a, effectively a construction manager from Big D Construction and they acted on RAF. And so that allowed us as Southwest Trends to be the general contractor, which saved us money in terms of having to pay another contractor and then also to be able to manage on our behalf. Yes. Um, so it yeah, so in a essence, lot of then if you have a construction manager, instead of paying the general to just overlook subs, you can overlook the subs through the use of the construction manager. Right. He's like, watching our dollars closer to that absolutely. also versus just uh, the general contractor because they're just trying to get the project done and, yep. oh, you know, an overruns an overrun or, uh, you know, a mistake and they just do it where the project manager can really catch things maybe beforehand because they're working, like I say, they're working more for us yep. than 
yeah. than themselves. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think the experience we had was like really positive. Um, you know, saved us quite a bit of money as well as like you know, doing some innovative things that helped us to um, bring in some additional amenities uh, for you know no cost to, you know, or less cost than the over total overall project was. So mm -hmm. it was worked out great. Yeah. yeah. But they and they also do different scopes of bids. You, you might get 13 or 15 scope of, of bids and that's just on different things. And then he goes through and make sure that we're meeting everything with those with those scopes versus saying the whole project is 42 million. Yeah. No, now you know what every project, the plumbing is and the electrical is and the furnishings and all of that, you go through it, it's all done separately in, in saving money. So well, as far as the expected timeline, again, we talk about it starting next year, but this is a multi-year process. So uh, to, to complete all this, not only from, you know, bringing on the financial aspects over four years, but just the logistics of it. So in 2023, we would plan on designing the public safety facility and completing the, the planning process for that. So that's the city planning process. Uh, 2024, complete the bidding to choose a contractor for the public safety with construction starting in the spring. And we anticipate about an 18 month construction. And we'd also use 2024 to design the MSB facility expansion and complete the planning process. 2025, we would compete the bidding and choose a contractor for the MSB uh, with construction sharing the spring. We expect about a 14 month construction. Uh, we'd also use 2025 to design the library facility and complete the planning pr uh, process. 2026 would be completing the bidding uh, to choose a contract for the library. That's about an 18 month construction process. And then we'll also in 2026, design the city hall remodel. Uh, 2027, we choose a contractor for that. So that's about 12 months. So it's, it's at 2028 to 2029 when you'd, when you'd expect uh, in this sort of what you have here, you know, fall 2025 public safety center, MSB late uh, summer of 2026, library fall of 2027, and city, city Hall early summer of 2028. So again, even though uh, we'd start funding the program if this was approved in 2023, this would take us five years to complete all the, uh, of the facilities. Um, I think we talked about that stuff. The estimated cost uh, of all these projects is not an inexpensive uh, project. Uh, it's, it's about $115 million uh, for all of our facilities, which would have a total annual debt, tax levy debt of $4.5 million, uh, utility debt of about $1.6 million. So a total uh, annual debt service of 6.1 million is what we're estimating now. So here's what the impact, and this is the exact chart that we uh, shared uh, with the public at each of the facility, uh, each of the park parties and different uh, ways we engage the public on. Uh, so basically, we'd look at uh, implementing a component of that each year over four years. So it would take $1.125 million in tax levy each of 23, 24, 25, and 26. The impact to a $370,700 building or house, uh, which is the uh, median value house now would be $8 per month uh, for 2023, uh, an additional $9 per month in 2024, uh, additional $8 per month in 2025, an additional $9 per month in 2026. So at the end, it would be an additional $34 per month to be able to fund that. Now we look at this as being sort of, we, we tried to present what we consider to be realistic and not overly uh, aggressive. Uh, this is based on uh, the assumption that we'd see about a 5% increase in market values. As I shared for, with you before, we've actually seen more uh, than that in the community. And we expect that we will probably see more, especially with the development that's on the table. But we sort of want to give people, a, uh, you know, I guess not too, we want to give a more conservative estimate uh, to people as we're looking at this. And let's let's maybe just take a couple of minutes that, you know, we had talked about it earlier that, you know, if, if, if we're going to take on a project of this magnitude, this is the ideal time because we're in such a growth period and and we've got industrial growth, we've got housing growth 
and these numbers will be impacted correctly. I mean, and, and can be impacted yeah. down the line as, as that growth continues to happen and things like that. I, I want to, because sometimes that gets lost in this process that we don't have an opportunity to talk about that. I want to just make sure that. By impact is just be clear too, like those numbers go down. For yes, months. they would. Yeah. The, the right. idea would be yep. based on what's happening here. The numbers could go down. Yes, and we're being we're being right up front. This is the actual cost. Yeah, and and you know, and I the way I always say to people is, I would expect these numbers to be impacted positively, but I'm certainly not going to put it out there that I that I think it's a certainty right. because we have no idea what's going to happen to the market over the next four years. It could be much better than we expect. It could be much worse than we expect. But I would also suggest that not unlike the staffing study program, you know, if we saw something that was a major impact like COVID again, you might say, well, maybe we need to take a year off of this program. But we have the ability, we have the ability this, to do that. We're not, we're not starting four projects all at once. Yes. And so, you know, there's, there's stuff that you'd have to do to meet the debt service for the projects you've already started. But if you hadn't started a project yet, you would always have the ability to say, man, this, this is the wrong time to be doing this. Let's, let's wait a year, you know, to catch up with things until we get a certain point now. You know, when we first start out, you know, the, uh, unfortunately, the public safety facility is the most expensive one. Um, so, you know, you might have to go in and say that there might be some debts. Uh, uh, <laughs> there might be some debt levy needs that we'd need to do the, the following year, but maybe you, you wouldn't uh, implement the entire program. Uh, so uh, that does by dividing us into four years, it allows us to and separating the actual construction of the facilities and not starting until we actually get those dollars uh, in place allows us some flexibility that if you did have a, something major happen that you could say, okay, we still need to continue forward with this, but maybe this isn't the year. So, so basically, you know, because we have got, you know, effectively four projects, it gives us like four years to stagger those. But once we hit that fourth year, once, oops, excuse me, once the last project is, you know, we lock into that and begin the project, then we're pretty much locked in because now we have the obligations. We have to, have to Yeah, but theoretically, we'd have all the dollars levied too. Sure. So we wouldn't start that last project until, we wouldn't start the last project until we have that last year funded. Right. Yeah. Um, just, uh, you know, one of the things I think is important to point out is some of the uh, community engagement uh, processes we've done uh, over the, the last several months. And we're going to continue to do these as we move into the future. I know the mayor has a presentation to the Lions. I think it is next week. And there's a, <laughs> there, there's a presentation to the Rotary uh, coming up. Uh, uh, I know so, it's coming. Bro. Yeah. So there's a uh, well, surprise. Uh, <laughs> The uh, just make the mayor pro tem do it. Yeah, <laughs> you don't want to be I the like mayor pro tem anymore, do you? <laughs> so, um, but we're going to continue to do these over the fall months too. But some of the stuff that we've done uh, up to this point, we did start with the initial sounding board group of residents that met in the late winter months to get a tour and provide feedback and the overall need for the program. Uh, we developed a page on our website dedicated to the information on this program. Included in that is we're recording this presentation now. Uh, so we'll put that out there so that people can be able to watch this afterwards and be able to you know, see the presentation and hear it at the same time too. Um, we've developed videos to put on our webpage and social media explaining different components of the plan. We've developed brochures to, to provide the public. Uh, we've participated in multiple community events uh, with information booths, so Fire and Ice, River City Days, the Line Senior Picnic, Touch a Truck, uh, we sent informational part, postcards and invitations to every resident in the community, inviting them to our open house. And then if they weren't able to come to the open house, it directed them towards our webpage, uh, you know, talking about the, uh, the, uh, the programs or this program itself. Have uh, we been getting any comments through that? Have you? Um, Kevin? Man behind the wall. Kevin, have uh, we been getting? No, we have not. Okay. <laughs> um, 
the park parties uh, that we had that were advertised in those, we had four of those, so one for each ward. Uh, we're, like I said, we're taping our budget work sessions and our building projects overall budget to provide a presentation to the residents on the web page so that sometimes I think it's a lot easier for people to not only see a presentation, but sort of hear the presentation that's going with it so they can hear some of the questions that are being asked and things like that. And then just general discussions around the community, at least at least from my perspective, um, you know, I try to make a point if I'm talking to somebody about, you know, that, you know, about the program and some of the stuff that we're looking at. And I think it's just going to be those types of discussions that, uh, you know, we continue to, to need to have. So that's our, our building uh, program uh, and just some of the, the specifics of that. Uh, other items to note in the budget for 2023, uh, we do have a fire department pumper, uh, number three. Uh, it's a million dollars. We're in essence just moving that up by two years um, from where, uh, where it was in the, the schedule. And actually, because of the way our replacement schedule works, other than moving it up uh, in the schedule, we don't really see the impact uh, of this until 2042, because in essence, we'd keep our old trucks. Uh, so uh, up until this point, we've sold our old trucks, we'd keep them, and now we'd spread the schedule. So we'd have three tiers of trucks. So we'd have one that's a first line, one that's a second line, and one that's a third line. And they'd have eight years of peace on each of those. Uh, and the reason we're suggesting that is because we found that we've had one, at least one major truck down 25% of the time. Uh, which only leaves us with two major pieces of, of apparatus. Um, so that's uh, uh, I, you're a short one again tonight. Unfortunately, it was kind of scary. It blew a tire. The ladder truck blew a tire right when it pulled into the back into the station. And I mean, it just echoed through the building. Luckily, it blew out the other way. Oh, jeez. And wow. but then it knocked all the airlines out. So the truck was just dead in the water right there so mechanics are coming in right now trying to get to and it, i mean it happens i mean these pieces yeah, these pieces of equipment i mean they you know i mean there's a lot of weight on those on those apparatus and stuff so i i, I like the thought of what's being talked about here and in essence just you know we keep our trucks on longer but we're able to keep them on longer because we divide them into uh different levels of response um, we have the addition of a drone in here for $10,000. This would be used for both of our utility and public safety services, but also marketing efforts. We have additional $10,000 towards internal diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, inclusion efforts and training. We have a tactical robot for police use for 4,000. I talked about this at the last meeting that this is really meant to try to protect officers and, uh, people who are barricaded in the property from not just sending people in right away, but being able to send uh, something in uh, to assess the situation before people were to go in to try to really uh, not uh, create uh, situations that cause dangerous uh, issues. Yeah, we had talked about at the last time we did a presentation about pilots for that, for the drone. Are, yeah. are, you, are there going to be some utility people trained in that as well? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, this is one thing that is becoming more and more evident, which is really sad, but, um, so we've had to increase our professional, uh, tree control services by 40,000. And this is really because of, of the significant rise in the emerald ash borer. It, it's getting really pretty prevalent around the community. Um, you know, our own, the city hall plaza up here has a number of trees that are already stricken and. Uh, it's going to continue to happen through the, the community. And really the, the issue for us is not just doesn't look good to, it doesn't look good to look at dead trees, but they also become hazard trees too. And we need to make sure that we take those down uh, before they become hazards. Is that the only way of treating Emerald Ash Borer? No, you, we have been treating it in City Square Park with an actual treatment. And the reason we've been doing it there is we've, it's not cheap. And we've tried to target it towards those areas that um, we want the mature trees to stay. that we want mature trees to be there. Uh, so the thing with the treatment is you can't miss a year. Uh, you have to do it every year, and if you miss a year, 
you know, they can get the, the bug in them. Uh, so we've sort of focused on those areas where we want to make sure there's mature trees. It's, it's maybe been a little bit easier in City Hall Plaza thinking that we're probably going to be redoing that uh, anyway. Um, so, um, you know, with, with limited resources, we try to keep it to those areas where mature trees are probably more important. Um, we talked about this with uh, public engagement efforts, so increasing our advertising for printing costs uh, and advertising to get out flyers and postcards for public engagement efforts. Uh, our fencing consortium, uh, we have $4,200 at uh, added towards that and that's to basically partner with other communities so that uh, we have access if there was to be a major public safety event to a uh, fence that we could secure our city hall facility uh, replacement of uh, uh, eight rifles within the police department to create more uh, well base you know take out of service ones that are probably too old to be out of service but also create some consistency between uh, our equipment, uh, protective equipment for mobile field force officers. For, so we have the need to help fit 12 officers um, to be able to protect them in any type of civil unrest or mass demonstrations uh, so that we have the right type of equipment. So when we get to the tax levy impact of this, um, so again, our, our median value house in the community for uh, taxes payable 2023 is $370,000. Uh, $700. Uh, that's up from $298,500 uh, for this uh, tax year. Uh, the actual uh, city taxes on the example in last year were $959. Uh, that same house would be $1,158. So an annual increase of $199 or $16.50 per month. So basically, again, it's the baseline operational levy growth would be $4.50 per month. The staffing study level growth would be at an additional $4 per month and the building improvement levy growth would be an additional $8 per month. So that's where you come up with that $16.50 per month. Uh, this sort of looks at the funding of the, of the facilities and sort of our baseline growth uh, over uh, the four year period. So looking at what, where a, a house would, uh, would go from 2022 uh, to 2026. So that's not just with the building program, it's also uh, assuming growth in our baseline services as well. And then this shows uh, where we would fall in the grand scheme of uh, overall tax levy impact within the metro area. Uh, we'd be number 56 uh, out of 84. Uh, so we'd be the 56th lowest out of 84 uh, cities in the metro area. Uh, we'd move from 78th to 56th lowest, but that assumes that all other cities had 0% increase. Uh, if we assumed all other cities had a 5% increase, uh, which, um, you know, as I've talked to other cities, it, it's been pretty clear that that's probably, it's probably more than 5%. Uh, we would uh, rank 64th out of 84 uh, cities, which is in the bottom 24% uh, of cities. Um, and I guess the other thing I'll point out in this, this chart here too, is I include our total levy. So this includes our general fund, our EDA, our tax abatement, uh, our cemetery fund and our equipment acquisition fund. Um, some, basically we include any fund that could have a tax impact on, on somebody. Some of these numbers uh, may only be reflective of general fund uh, uh, levies that are out there. Talking about other communities? Other communities. Okay. Uh, so it's not always a complete apples to apples comparison. Uh, as I mentioned before, our tax rate under this scenario would, would go down uh, from 32.133% to 31.592%. It should actually say a decrease of 1.5%, uh, not 1.7%. Uh, we'd be in the bottom 33% of cities for uh, tax levy per capita. 
And if we extrapolate over the, and this is really difficult because you have no idea what other cities are gonna do, but if you use sort of that 5% per year, uh, plus or minus for other cities, uh, basically at the end of this building program, we'd be about right smack dab in the center. Um, but I think the important thing to point out is that we're still gonna see growth for another 10 years, at least after that happens. And so I sort of see this as sort of the, the peak and then our growth will be able to bring that back down again. Um, so, you know, there's a benefit, I know the mayor mentioned it before, um, this is not a program you'd want to have to want to have to undertake if you were seeing no growth in the community, uh, because that means that all of that impact would go on uh, existing uh, residents. Um, you know, it's it's not fun to have to to deal with these types of programs, but uh, but um, you know they they are important to to keep up with. And if you were going to do it, doing it during a time of tax levy or tax. Uh, value growth is probably the best time that you could do it. Uh, so um, so that's just, again, I, I just want people to have, I don't want people to, to be blindsided by the impacts uh, of it. I, I think it's better that we're out there just sort of talking about what to expect during this program. And I'd like to just kind of talk a little bit. There, there's been some stuff floating out there about that. There hasn't been a, conversations about this and that it's rather quick that we're jumping to it but we have had conversations for years about this and some of these items have been on talking about for eight ten years already about how, you know about when to do it and and because of the complexities of what we have in this with you know we can't do anything until the police and the library move out but you got to get them built first and there's just a lot of pieces and parts to this and i I think it's important to know that, you know, we've looked at multiple different ways. We looked at stretching this out over a longer period of time. And you guys were all sitting up here. We weren't saving anything. And the fear was it's going to cost us more the longer we wait. And th these aren't things of, of uh, we, we think that we want. These are really of needs. Our buildings are... I, I still open the invitation if anybody wants to come to our facilities. Um, if if I can't do it, somebody will get somebody to tour, give you that ability to come look at the facilities. The facilities are definitely outdated. We have, you know, uh, it's obvious the police are in too small of a building. Uh, the fire needs a major remodel <clears throat> due to all of the uh, the current issues with the carcinogens and their equipment and all that stuff that that they're dealing with. So they need a major remodel. Uh, the public works facility, you know, we're storing, like Matt said, a third of our equipment outside. And in today's days of computers and hydraulics, that's just not good for them in our climate. So it, like I said, I'm with Matt, this is not easy to take on a task like this, but at some point we had to do it. And, you know, we've talked about it for, for a long time and I, I just think, you know, we've looked at it and I think this is, I can't say it's the easiest way, but I think it's the best way for us to move forward and to be able to complete these projects. But, but then once these projects are complete, that really, and if I still understand it right, these projects will take us into the future where we'll still be okay in our, in our build time. Yeah, I think they do two things is first of all, and I know this was something that I think, especially Councilmember Hatfield said, don't design this, make sure you design this so that it takes care of our ultimate needs. And so to me, it's doing two things is we're dealing with where we need to be for ultimate needs, but we also then, you know, one of the challenges in this program is we haven't really had a funding source to go back to. And so this also provides a future council, uh, you know, 20, 25 years down the road when we need to make major renovations into facilities again, you know, it may not be that we have to add on to facilities, but we're certainly going to, I mean, we're here forever. We have to plan to be here forever. And so how, how do we make sure that, that people in the future have those resources to be able to be able to reinvest back in these facilities so that we can continue to have good, good quality facilities, even after we're fully grown? Because uh, you know, we've talked about these issues are a lot easier to deal with when you're growing than when you're not growing. 
um, the next time you, that somebody has to deal with these facilities, we will not be in a growth mode. We're, this is, to me, this is part of us planning for when we're fully developed. Yeah, I would just comment too that, you know, you talk about, if you stretch it out, there, it, it actually could cost more. And, you know, some of that conversation was just like goods and materials or thing. Like there's also the cost of, of staffing and, and turnover because, you know, you're bringing, you're hiring people. We, 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 already, we invested in this <laughs> staffing study but but turnover occurs when you or when you're trying to hire and recruitment costs and you're walking them through dated buildings and there's a cost there that's not a dollar that you can always put a figure on it, but it's an important cost. Um, you, you talk about you know I just had a conversation with a couple of people that you know um, didn't necessarily realize that you could live in Chaska and work on other fire departments, right? And so like the 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 attraction of of other fire departments in the area, but you, you know you, ideally it's, it's nice if, if you're fire department lives here uh, type thing. And so those are the things that are conversations that occur and people don't necessarily realize. And I just, like I said, I just want to point out there is not an easy dollar to put on turnover, but it matters. I mean, you're attracting talent and you're walking them through dated buildings. I mean, dated buildings, it's like, you know, the equipment and the functionality of yeah. their workspace in order for them to do their job most effectively. I think that, that that's all a thing that you can put a dollar on probably just work pit place efficiency and making sure that mm -hmm. that the staff has all the tools you know at their disposal in order to do their job most effectively and if we're, we're spending you know minutes and hours moving trucks in and out of the garages just to do tasks i mean that's taking that person away from another task at hand and also impacting our quality of service for our residents. Yeah, especially if you have like a water main break or something that's, you know, more of an emergency situation and you're having to move out vehicles to get to a particular piece of equipment, minutes matter. So I joke about this, but when Brian was interviewing for the position, I didn't even want to take him on a tour of the police station because I, I thought he might say no. <laughs> I mean, that's probably Yeah. About initiatives around diversity and things. If you were a woman walking into our fire station or police department, you wouldn't want to work there. You would say, there's not even a locker for me. Why? They obviously don't want me here, and, which is absolutely not true, but, um, and is no fault of the police department. That's just a part of, we need to get that. So I think even just surrounding that and the initiatives for those pieces, um, making it a place people want to work too. So, yeah, I mean, I think it comes down to the simple fact of the matter that when these facilities were each built, Chasco was at a population of whatever size, right? Um, and each of the facilities were built with the impact of growth, but we have expanded and we've gone and stretched beyond the timeline of which every building was met uh, as far as, you know, capacity um, at such and such point. And we've gone and they've been... Um, the staff have been ingenious enough to make the buildings work most effectively in order to do their day-to-day -day functions, um, whether it be the police station using a, you know, their break room as a <laughs> material oh, processing lab or uh, one of the old holding cells as a file cabinet uh, storage facility now and, and, and things of that nature is, you know, uh, municipal service building where they put their lockers and things of that nature. So I think all the facilities have really done and all the staff have really done their best effort to get us to this point. And now it's imploring not only us as a council, but us as a community to take pride in the facilities that we have and reinvest back into it because we are a growing community and we have to look forward to that growth in order to build the facilities that meet that need so that we can have the best small town in Minnesota. In the big context of you know what you just said, you know, when we built this building in 1987, right? Yep. Um, you know, if you look at the, 19, the 1990 census put us at, you know, 11, 11.3 thousand people, right? So we're almost, you know, so you, that's a few thousand, probably a couple thousand less in 1987. So you're looking at almost like three times the size now. And, it, you know, this building served us really well for all those years, but, you know, we need to, and we're going to continue growing for some time. So we need to, you know, build those facilities which are going to last us for that next generation. So and it's, it's time. Well, the schedule for this year uh, would be, you know, by, uh, so we're uh, considering the adoption of the maximum tax levy and preliminary budget 
Uh, we also have the EDA uh, ma min maximum levy that we also have to consider tonight. But I, everything that you've seen in here and for impacts includes the EDA in there. So uh, it's, it's all inclusive in that. We need to establish it by the September 30th. So that's why we're taking that up today. Uh, in October through November, uh, we'll be reviewing the enterprise fund budgets. Uh, December 5th would be our annual truth and taxation hearing. So that's when uh, we make the final presentation of the budget. We don't make a decision on that night, but it's the public hearing that is advertised to people on their truth and taxation statements. And then December 19th would be when we'd have to adopt our final 2023 budget and then establish our final tax levy. Questions? Kind of impact. Do, are we thinking possibly the community center can have with that task force going? And do we have any idea, or is it too? No, it's too early. And honestly, I I see different sources of funding to support that. Um, so there's really. I just had that question asked. Well, you're in a community center. And I just wanted to make sure that I understand because I was thinking that as well because that's an enterprise fund. Yeah, but I I, I want to be clear that I've got the right message. Yeah, we've been. I mean, there is some question with the community center in that we have some of our what would be considered in other cities general park and rec services that are included within our community center, um, which should be included in our general fund. But we've been sort of taking a stab at trying to pull every year something more out of that should be in the general park general fund instead of the community center fund out so that we have the proper positions that are in there. Um, but that's going to be a discussion of the uh, you know, of the task force is, you know, how do we make this sustainable? I do think it ends up being different types of, of sources of funding. Um, the reason these are focused on here as a building of program is because these, these are our general fund services. They, the only source of income that we have to support these, I shouldn't say that completely. There is, I mean, we've seen out of the 6.1 million you know, almost $2 million as enterprise fund uh, per year. But, but that's part of some of the efficiencies we've had of having like our electric and water and sewer department in with our public works uh, department is that we've shared some of those facilities. But in general, you know, these are our general fund services that are tax levy supported. And that's why we focused on them sort of separately. Can't charge an admission fee to come into City Hall. No, no. <laughs> That's sort of what it boils down yeah. to. Yeah. Is there uh, and is there still opportunities for us to look at like state seen in some places? And I know that you yep. and I have talked about that a little bit, but so you know, so I you know, <laughs> there's been some police stations that have been paid for through bonding dollars to state. I don't just, get it. I don't get it either. I don't but. get it. It seems like that should be a community's responsibility, but it has happened. Uh, there's been some library facilities that have been in, included in with some state grant funding or even some bonding dollars. I don't get it, but uh, it's happened. And so just because we do this doesn't mean that it's going to preclude us from looking at those other sources of funds to be able to support it. To me, that's one of the, also the advantages of having sort of a four-year program is it gives us some ability to say, okay, we have a few legislative sessions we can go through here, um, you know, where we can, you know, sort of address some of these needs. You know, we have some grant cycles to go through. And so to me, all those will do is, is help uh, reduce the overall impact of the program as we go through. They've been talking more about the congressional uh, spending uh, missing a word in there. Basically, the earmarks. They, you know, uh, with the, with the congressionally though. directed spelling. Yeah. That, I mean, because there's been some stuff in those that have gone toward buildings too. So, uh, yeah. I mean, it's just that stuff got to stay on top of all. Yeah. Of and I, to, Not to with me, you. I don't get it. To me, they're sort of head scratchers because to me, those should be, if our city is, is benefiting from a police station, it shouldn't be everybody else that's paying for it. But if they're going to, I mean, if, if they're giving it out to somebody, you know, it's it's something we should stay on top of, and we will. Jizzle got twenty five million. 
Yeah. If it was five, we'd be probably thrilled. I think uh, Ryan wasn't the city of Crystals Police Department. Wasn't that a good portion of that covered through the bonding bill? Sounds familiar. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it's happened. There's no doubt. Well, as long as we're looking at that, I think that's important. People are lobby jackets on, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, the what you would be, I'll stop sharing this. What you would be looking at for tonight is uh, the adoption of resolution 2022-112, which will be adopting the proposed assessed 2022 payable 2023 maximum property tax levy. And in that resolution uh, that Noel put together also has our uh, plenary budget numbers as well, which between our general fund, EDA, cemetery, and abatement funds, uh, we estimate it uh, will be uh, $29,890,348. And it's a total tax levy of $15,216,147. Any questions? Why Matt was um, doing his presentation, I came, uh, I am back at the meeting. So thank you, uh, Hotel Hubbard for running till I got back, I was at swearing in of new firefighters at the fire station tonight. So um, I was honored to be able to do that. So, so I'm back with it there now, so. All right, any other questions for Matt? Uh, otherwise I'd be um, looking for our, our thoughts or emotion. Just comment that we've said it, we'll say it again. We've seen this a lot, right? Like the lack of questions, the head nods, um, don't understate the importance and value that we put in, you know, don't underestimate the importance of value, right? We've, we've looked at a lot. And I appreciate that. I think the time that I've been on part of the cycle now, the fourth time, I have appreciated um, the approach we've taken with work sessions, which remind the public are open to the public and welcome to attend. Because it, for me, it's just always helped piecemeal a little bit because you digest it, you think about it, you come back with questions, you learn more. And then even like this, like I said, you know, none of that was new for anyone up here, but it's good hearing it again because it's for some questions that maybe you didn't have before. You want to, you know, checking, you know, verify your notes. So <laughs> I think that's just important to say because again, if someone were recording this and they're like, they didn't ask a single thing and they're, you know, raising, you know, raising this thing, it's like we've had a lot of questions and, and I think we've, a lot of us have expressed our um, appreciation that it's not easy to, increase bills for people and taxes and then that and um, but understand the importance of maintaining a pride in your city when it comes to some of these buildings and facilities and staffing and, and all those types of things too so just want to say that again and remind everyone and I, I think your comment about pride is very important but but we're to the point where we, we have to we, don't, yeah. we just don't it's have more an embarrassment, right? We it's your yes. point. Or, <laughs> right. or we're going to get caught in a mistake yeah. that's going to cost us through, unfortunately, uh, a lawsuit or something. And, mm -hmm. and now that's money not well spent right. ever. And uh, so we, we have gotten to some of those points where we, we have to make these changes. And, and it, it goes back to what's been said up here. Truly, everything about it, we're at that point that our buildings are. 30 years ago and we're not 30 years ago anymore today and it's different it's a different world today so anyone else comment well uh i would look for someone to either uh make a, a motion of approval of the 2022 dash 112 approving a proposed assessed 2022 payable 2023. And this is again maximum tax levy. So, what we adopt tonight is the maximum. It cannot ever go up from this to, in this year's cycle. It can go down, um, but it cannot uh, be raised any higher. So, 
So moved. So I have a motion uh, by Councilmember Hubbard. I will second it. Second by Councilmember Wong. Again, this is a motion to adopt resolution 2022-112, adopting the proposed assessed 2022 payable 2023 maximum ta property tax levy. Discussion. I just want to say, I think uh, Councilmember Dra summed it up well um, about we have seen this. You might not be asking questions, but we've seen this and we've asked a lot of questions in the process. And we, we know that this is um, a big step for us, but it's, it's something that's not going away and it's not getting cheaper and not getting easier. That's something that uh, is, we are at a necessary necessity on some of these and most of these uh, facilities at this point. So. Okay, last call. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Post same sign. Aries.